Yeah, what the hell was that planet? What the hell? What the hell is that mech? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I got a bullet point. Mech. WTF. <laughs> everyone to Krypton to Alderaan. I'm Joey, your Star Wars lover, and with me is Royish Goodlooks. Hello, podcast. Hello, Joey. Hello. And we're the podcast that analyzes all kinds of nerdy pop culture stuff, but it's mostly Star Wars. And this episode, we'll be discussing The Bad Batch Season 2, Episode 5, Entombed. But first... I wanted to do something that I don't do nearly enough here, and that is thank all of our wonderful listeners and subscribers. We've had a lot more activity on YouTube lately, which is amazing. New subscribers. It's really great to see. So hello, new listeners, and thank you so much for taking the time to subscribe and comment. And thank you to the listeners who have been here for a while and put up with us navigating through all of this. We really appreciate these interactions. Part of what makes content creation so fun is interacting with other fans over our shared love of a thing and sharing in speculations and theories and all that fun stuff. It's so much more fun to do as a group. Not that I don't have a ton of fun doing this with Royce through (laughs) the computer, but it's just really great. I do this because I love Star Wars and I want to spend time with my BFF for F. But I also do it because I love talking with other people about this stuff and gaining perspectives and, you know, sharing our love of this thing together. So thank you all very much. I appreciate each and every one of you. It's been amazing to see the more interactions that we've had lately. So keep it up. Thanks so much. Let us know what you think of this episode when we're all done. And like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. We also have a new review on Apple Podcasts, which I will now read. Five stars. Great podcast. Krypton to Alderaan is a great podcast with a fun dynamic. If you want to nerd out about pop culture stuff, but mostly Star Wars, it's a great podcast for you. And that is from Scotty Holiday, friend of the show. Scotty Holiday, if you are unfamiliar, go check out their YouTube channel. They do a lot of Star Wars stuff and breakdown videos and all kinds of stuff like that. And they were also on our Krypton to Alderaan episodes. They were here with me reviewing Andor and it was a lot of fun. We had a good time. So go check out those episodes as well and go subscribe to Scotty's channel, Scotty Holiday on YouTube. I love it. I love all the community nature, man. Comments like I've had a love-hate relationship with comments through the years, but I think I've gotten (laughs) over like 100,000 comments in my YouTube career. So I've seen the gamut, but it always feels like fuel for the fire. Like even if it is a negative comment, you know, your hair looks stupid or whatever it is, <laughs> it it pushes you to go forward. And luckily the reviews and comments that have come through have been awesome. So I'm also stoked. Thank you, all of you internet warriors out there for sharing your opinion. Yes. You know, you bring up a good point. Internet warriors. What would fans of our podcast be called? Should that be, should I hold that for the surprise question? Yeah, they're not Kryptonians or Alderanians. There's some kind of right. mashup there. Inter, yeah. Intergalactic planetaries. I don't know. Survivors. Extinct. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? We'll mull it over or send us some ideas. There you go. You let us know. <laughs> uh, have people commented to tell you that your <laughs> hair looks stupid? Uh, I have. I have one, one of those comments. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Nothing's off limits, dude. (laughs) All right. Well, I guess let me know if you think my hair looks stupid. They can't (laughs) see us. That's the best part of this. All right. Let's get into the Bad Batch Season 2, Episode 5, Entombed. Here is a self-made little synopsis. On an unnamed junkyard planet, Omega and Wrecker are on a mission to find a compressor. I assume it's for their ship. I don't know if compressors Mm. have a different use in the Star Wars universe. But anyway, with the salvage piece and other trinkets in hand, they return to Sid's parlor on Ord Mantell, where they're greeted by the rest of Clone Force 99, as well as archaeologist slash pirate Fee Genoa. 
Among the heap of scraps, Fee discovers an interesting-looking compass. Intrigued, Fee convinces the Batch to join her on a quest for treasure following an ancient relic that points the way to adventure and danger. Put that on the DVD box set. <laughs> we just need a, a clip of you uh, saying that to insert. I love it. You got a button it. for that? I can make one. <laughs> All right, Royce. I am very excited to ask you this question right up front. What did you think of this episode overall? Yeah, so we've been talking about the side quest thing. What's the point? Or is there a point? This was the first episode that I felt I actually watched the majority of in a traditional sense that I wasn't just like taking notes the entire time, although I took plenty of notes, but it just felt like you had to watch the story unfold. You didn't really know where it was going. You know, they were looking for trash at the beginning. The trash led them to that weird planet and you're thinking they're in caves and then they're in a mech warrior. We're back in 1995 and it's like, I didn't, you didn't know where it was going. And then you're like, it must be an ancient Jedi temple. Is it a spaceship? Is it a seeing stone? No, it's like a planet killing device. Classic Star Wars doomsday thing. But I found myself just mostly just watching it and wondering where it was going to go. And I didn't think it was going to end up being, I thought they were going to steal the crystal and try to sell it or something kind of cliche. But it seemed to have a little bigger impact at the end. Actually getting the treasure, whether or not that was actually something they should have even been doing there. I feel like they were trying to hint to us there that like, no, you shouldn't be searching for treasure because this is the second time your world has come crumbling down. Like last week, it's like the last minute or two brought it back around to not being such a side quest of like, that's why, you know, in conclusion, here's why this story was relevant to the future of the family of the Bad Batch. I'm a little long-winded there, but that, that was my general takeaway from it. Yeah, I feel similarly in a lot of ways in that I didn't know I was missing the mystical stuff in Star Wars until this episode. You said watching and wondering. I feel the same exact as that with maybe a different connotation of the term. Like, I was in wonder of this episode, which is something that I've been missing and I didn't know. I mean, like I talk about on this podcast all the time, I'm loving all of this, but I didn't know that I was missing that mystical wonder, sense of adventure stuff that is pretty Star Warsy to me. You know, a couple episodes ago, we were talking again about the Star Wars box and, and I said something like, you have to be okay with Star Wars grow with the definition of what Star Wars is growing, but also hold on to what makes it special to you because that's what makes it special. I love that quote, by the way. That's got that is the <laughs> the adage that I'm you're screenshotting from your book right there. That's the one. <laughs> Put it on the DVD <laughs> box cover. This is the kind of stuff that makes Star Wars special to me. I just love that part of Star Wars, the mystical stuff, the sense of wonder and the adventure. And you combine that with like an archaeologist slash pirate, although I do have some problems with some of these more Indiana Jones ideas. It belongs in a museum or pilfering a tomb kind of thing. I really, really loved this episode because as I was watching it, I felt a certain kind of way when they're moving the glowing stones and they're looking through the compass to see the illuminated parts on the walls and all that kind of thing made me feel a certain way that I love feeling. Mm. I was like, let's go. I want to go. I want to be with the Bad Batch. I want to be with Fee. I want to go on this adventure. Yeah, as like a geologist, I would assume any rock that can illuminate is like, whoa. Like, Or <laughs> a rock that has like magical powers and can like destroy planets or be a blade of light that can cut through blast doors. Like that's got to be a geologist's dream. Yeah, yeah. If it falls into the wrong geologist's hands... <laughs> Uh, yeah, for everybody listening, I'm a geologist. It is super cool to see that stuff. And I love old stuff and old rocks. And I also love robots. So this episode just hit a lot for me. <laughs> I also love Lord of the Rings and the heart of the mountain. Come on, dude. When they walked up to the door and they were like, this is a dead end. I was like, dude, speak you friend, gotta speak friend and, and enter. enter. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. And then also, we're, we're jumping around here a lot, but I, uh, I'm excited about this. But, but there were so many sci-fi references that I love, I think. And so Indiana Jones and Lord of the Rings and 
the fifth element. I mean, the stone looked like one of the stones from the fifth element. And picture me, the Leonardo DiCaprio meme (laughs) pointing at the TV. Uh, So in conclusion, I really loved this episode a lot. Hmm. It it, it renewed, it invigorated my sense of wonder within Star Wars. Yeah, you had to be willing to go on that trip, though. So again, part of that, like, this was a different style. Last week was like that offshoot race episode, you know? You know, we had a bad guys episode, we had a good guys episode, a race, and now we have this adventure in the in the cave searching for treasure yeah i do think a lot of the themes that we've discussed on the last couple of episodes are popping up here as well which i think really cements all of this together and we're going to get into that but one of the first things that i noticed this episode especially when they're figuring out the compass in sid's parlor and then as they're making their way through like the tomb or whatever they called it, was the music. I I wrote this down. I was so excited to talk to you about the music because it felt so Star Wars-y to me. The orchestra, it felt very John Williams, like Star Wars and some Indiana Jones Mm. stuff. But I'm curious what you thought about the music this episode. So I told you before we recorded, I was like, I don't have many notes about the music. I would have to assume that like it just blended in And I wasn't listening to it. I found myself more visually captivated in this episode. And I think like music when done well, doesn't necessarily, we've talked about this plenty of times. Yeah. It didn't really stand out when they were in the caves. The the music stood out to me at the very beginning of the episode though. They were looking for junk and the music there was not like Omega and Wrecker having a fun time searching through crap. Mm, Interesting. It wasn't like, it didn't like, have this bubbly trash in the camp vibe or whatever, you know, it was way more eerie. And then it cut away back to their lair on Ord Mantell. And it had a very like, wah, transition between the two scenes. And so right away, I was like, this is something's, you know, I got a bad feeling about this. It it didn't (laughs) set it up to be like a lighthearted adventure. And it was kind of somewhere in between that. It wasn't really a dark episode or a bubbly, happy episode. So I don't know if that was intentional, but Yeah, I'm going to have to watch again and listen for what the music in the caves was. But that first moment, 100% stood out to me as like foreshadowing something bad is going to happen. I wonder if that's because we get kind of the reintroduction of a couple of characters that we've been without for a couple of episodes. Like we get more Hunter in this episode. We see more Hunter than we have in a little bit. And we have Echo there. And they're the two kind of more solemn characters maybe grumpy additions to the crew. So I wonder if that's sort of being brought out by their presence, what you're describing. Instead of it being a lighthearted, whimsical tones, it's more like there's more gravity. Well, once again, they weren't all excited to go on the mission. It was really Omega that was like, come on, there could be treasure. Like, it could be fun. Like, she was trying to be upbeat about it. But everyone was like, ah, it sounds risky. Like, It's not an actual mission. Let's not do it. And they go on it anyway. That's a good point. I think it brings up one of the themes that we've discussed, which is like the Bad Batch growing beyond what it means to be a soldier. That's a quote I have written down here. Wrecker says, we don't have a mission right now. Mm. That's what he has to say to get Hunter and Echo to want to go on the quest. Like you have to be like, we don't have to be soldiers right now. So we can go do this other thing. I think Omega literally says, like, it might be fun. Yeah, yeah. And the only Fee, we got to talk about Fee. Fee wants to do it because Fee is an archaeologist pirate. (laughs) Omega wants to do it because she wants to have fun. Looking back, I want to have fun, right? I want to watch an episode and have fun. Wrecker is game for anything. (laughs) Hunter is, maybe he's like parental and cautious and like overly so. And then Echo is just a grump. Like, I wish someone would just be like, Echo, just have fun. Get the stick out of your butt. He's just sitting at the bar slunched over and he's like, you remember what happened the last time we went treasure hunting? It didn't go as planned. Echo, when has any mission Ooh, that ever been, gone? That would have been some good you dialogue. You got hooked yeah. up. You got turned into a cyborg, dude. Mm. Can you just have some R&R? I'm with you. I, I didn't pick up on Echo being the the downer, but I definitely picked up on Hunter being the downer, which I got to eat my own words now because I was like, bring <laughs> Hunter in. He's the 
leader. And he was a big curmudgeon. He had no fun. He was skeptical the whole time. Uh, maybe he's like jealous that Omega is now coming into her own and trying to make her own decisions and assert herself as more of a leader, even though she's not the leader yet, but she's at that age where it's like, I'm going to push back a little bit more than I used to and looking up to Fee instead of Hunter. So maybe there's like a jealousy there, but it's clear, like we talked about last episode about the rifting. Hunter's not happy on that mission. Maybe Echo wasn't happy. You know, Tech and Wrecker seem to be kind of indifferent or Tech was stoked to find out about the, it's a, more than a thousand years old. Oh, wow. Whoa, what do you know? And I guess you say Wrecker is up for anything when they open the door. He's like, it is a secret door. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> that's, that is really interesting, you know, side quest story to pick up a crystal, but you're seeing that rifting, you know? Yeah, yeah. 100%. That's another theme we've talked about. Like, will the Bad Batch go their separate ways? Like you said, we're seeing that a little bit. I do think Hunter is acting the way he's acting because he's overprotective of Omega and he sees her interacting with Fee. I think about like what goes on off camera, what goes on when we're not watching and maybe she's developing more of a relationship with Fee. Mm. But also in this episode, we see her repeating Fee, mimicking Fee's movements when she used to do that to Hunter and he's becoming maybe a little bit jealous or maybe a little bit jealous and a little bit more protective because he doesn't know Fee. He doesn't trust Fee. She's kind of a pirate. I loved the, when they first got on the ship to go off on the mission, the framing of the shot was Fee and Omega on each side of the screen with their legs kicked up, sitting on like a stool in the middle of the screen. And Hunter is off in the background, like twirling his knife, you know, brooding <laughs> as, as Omega and Fee are like commiserating. And he's like rrr, rrr, being a grump, you know, it was perfect little, not word painting, but cinematic, you know, interpretation of that relationship growing. I thought that was perfect. Oh yeah, that is perfect. I gotta go back and watch to pick that up, but I love that. Let's get into the intelligence of and the impressionability of Omega. Because we saw her doing this stuff in the first season with Hunter, like mimicking his movements, mimicking the way he talked, that kind of stuff. And from there, we saw her become a very competent strategist and competent on the battlefield. And now she's doing it with Fee. She's repeating what Fee says and, and mimicking her movements. And I think that that's very like she's a young kid and she's impressionable. But also she's able to take that and use it. She, she's learning from doing all of that. She's testing her ability to do what these adults do in the world and then is able to learn and grow and become more able, I guess. So I thought that that was interesting, more, more than just Hunter's maybe jealousy involved, but Omega's ability to pick some of this stuff up and adds to her character development as we're going through this show, I think. Do you think it's healthy development or do you think she's picking up some more bad traits than good traits or vice versa? I think it's more, it seems to be more healthy right now. We talked about this last episode a little bit, and then we got some comments on it um, on the episode. The idea that Omega still wants to help, she still does that above anything else, even with someone like Sid, who is not the most trustworthy person. Her go-to is, we need to do this because this person needs help. So she seems to be using all of her powers for good at the moment. Mm. It's not like Grogu who started force choking <laughs> people. <laughs> She's not gone that far. That's that's interesting though. Like I, I'm with you, but I almost think like, again, more foreshadowing of like, she's so accepting and she's seeing a role model in Fee and Sid. And I feel like, you know, with this mission with Fee, it was to go get this treasure. And Fee was like, yeah, lots of money. If we can get that crystal. And we know that the Bad Batch needs money for their freedom or something. You have a spaceship. <laughs> Just go to a different desert planet in the Outer Rim. You'll be you'll be mm. fine. You know, Luke hid there for 18 years. He was fine, except for one time. But Obi-Wan <laughs> saved him or, you know, Aunt Peru <laughs> saved him. So you'll probably be OK. Just fly. I don't know why they need money. That's kind of an odd thing now that I'm thinking about it. Mm. But she's looking up to Fee 
and they're going to go get treasure. And they've had two episodes about treasure that like money is an important thing. And she's so young. And so she was motivated to go on that mission because maybe it would be fun. But I feel like the treasure part is part of it, that she's like lusting for the freedom is, mm. is so important to them. But, and she knows that she needs money to do that rather than just like, we can just be here with the family and be happy with what we've got, play it safe and be calculated. You know, she wasn't in the war. So she's not, she isn't as hardened as them, you know? So she's okay to take those risks that most, you know, younger people are. But it's motivated by money in that episode, at least. And same thing in the, the premiere episode. So I feel like that's a little bit of a path to the dark side. Maybe I'm thinking too far ahead, but I'm, I'm seeing some negative, uh, some toxic behavior that she might be picking up if your role model is going to be a treasure hunter. Interesting. Some subliminal capitalism in these episodes. Maybe, huh? I don't I know. didn't even, yeah, no, I think that that's a really good point. Putting such importance on money that you think you need to be free. Yeah, I didn't even think of it that way, but you're so right. Now there's two episodes that have been like that so far and Sid's the one, Sid is the one convincing them that they need to, they need money to be free. Yeah, maybe they realize they're like, we don't need the money. Like we ha we can just go. We, we don't have yeah. a boss. Like Sid's not our boss. Right. And maybe that'll all come to a head like we've said, but they also like, they in, within the Star Wars galaxy, they still need to like buy supplies and rations and stuff like that. And they can't get chain codes or whatever you need from the Empire yeah. to do mm. that now. So uh, there's a little bit there where they might feel tied to this way of life for now because they can't support themselves. They might not be able to support themselves otherwise. But I do like that way of thinking. I hope it doesn't negatively impact Omega, but I also am really on board for, for an anti-capitalist, for some <laughs> anti-capitalist uh, story worked into here. So hmm. maybe they will address it. That would be cool. I don't know if Disney would take that route, but... <laughs> we'll see. But another kind of negative, I think, of being with this group of people, as far as Fee goes... There's a lot of Indiana Jones in this episode, obviously, but maybe some more negative aspects are that Fee is a like tomb pilferer, right? Treasure hunter, whatever you want to call it. You're stealing. Stealing. And, you know, that's obviously not a good thing for Omega to learn. But then there's one really weird scene when Omega puts the compass in the wall to turn the room upside down to walk on the path. The compass gets stuck. Fee says it served its purpose. Scara Nals reclaimed it. And then Omega says, and, you know, Omega repeats that. So Fee is like simultaneously this pilferer tomb raider on the scale of Indiana Jones. This belongs in a museum kind of thing, but also has a respect for the history and the culture of a thing. And mm -hmm. is like, okay with it. So there's a weird, there's just a little bit of something weird there, I guess. I get that. And I think I could pick up on a thread there. Because Fee is like, they introduced her the first episode. She's in, in the background for the next couple. And now we got to meet her. And like you're saying, like, she was kind of romantic about it has returned. You know, now its watch has ended. It was like so lofty the way she thought about it rather than like, oh, damn, we need that compass to find the treasure. I feel like we talked about this with the clones last week or the Bad Batch last week. I don't want to like have this be a trope for us. She's got to have the force or be a Jedi. She's got a sword. If you were a Jedi and you couldn't reveal you were a Jedi, I'd feel like you would still want a sword. You wouldn't go right to blaster. You'd have a baton or something or like Ray's staff. She saves Wrecker from a boulder that falls from the sky. Out of nowhere, she pushes Wrecker out of the way. You gotta have Jedi reflexes if you're gonna pilfer tombs. And <laughs> when Hunter falls down the tunnel... She grabs the grappling hook with her hands. So she's oh, yeah, got yeah, these yeah. crazy reflexes, right? And we've talked about this with the Bad Batch. Like, do, wh how is Tech able to do the race? Just because he was smart or, you know, whatever. I'm a little less certain that the Bad Batch are Jedis, but like, Fee, we don't know anything about. She's got this respect for the tomb, but she wants the crystal. And uh, there's more to, there to be revealed. Because if she's just a pirate, she could have just been Hondo, you know? Or... Job of the Hut or any other random pirate guy. There's some mystery there. I'm hoping that there's a there there, but like 
Is she a Jedi? Is she not? She's got the reflexes. She's got respect. So I think that's interesting. You're making me realize something that I never thought about before, which is that archaeologists in the Star Wars universe all seem to be a little extra and special. Between the three that I know, Fee, Dr. Aphra, and the archaeologist in Star Wars Resistance, whose name I can't remember, they all seem to have a little bit extra stuff about them, whether it's from like navigating booby traps and having to have reflexes or whatever. But yeah, I, I don't know. You just made me realize that putting all the pieces of the puzzle together. So who knows? Something that this episode did, again, the, the mystical nature of it all and stuff like what you're describing here, it really like fueled me. I want to know more. I want to learn more. I love this mystical. I love this extra canon stuff. Right? Yeah, what the like, hell was that planet? What the hell? What the hell is that mech? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I got a bullet yeah. point. Mech. WTF. <laughs> that's older than the Jedi. She's the one that says it's older than the Jedi. That's another yeah. case in point. There. Yeah, yeah. She knows a lot and she calls them the ancients. I had some stuff about this. I will say that the idea about this is pretty well covered by Alex on Star Wars Explained. He just put out a video, so go watch that video. It looks to be like there are ties to this alien race from Jedi that we're introduced to in Jedi Fallen Order called the Zepho. They're an ancient species, older, Force-sensitive species, older than the Jedi, and they build tech that protects their temples. We've never seen one as big as this mech was, but they look very similar and they shoot the blue laser. There's some connections mm. to it. Go listen. Go watch Alex on uh, Star Wars Explained. He summarizes it all much better than I could. But there's some connections there. But yeah, we've never seen like a huge droid like this before. And there was so much speculation because we saw this image before the show came out. And everyone thought it was like a mech Zillow beast, which was a monster from the Clone Wars something made to combat the mechzilla uh the zillow beast and stuff like that and it was just it's just an ancient droid that has like death star tech on its face incredible i love it i i mean mecha godzilla i love shit like this honestly i love giant robots and kaiju it was curious that's for sure you're talking about the sense of wonder and then they like destroy it at the end it's like that's the end of that yeah so make up your own head cannon <laughs> Hey, that's funny. It's like, we won't be answering no, no further questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they're like, we literally, we can't power it up ever again. That's over. Do you think, though, that the Empire, we, we know Palpatine shows up this season from trailers and stuff. Do you think that the Empire finds the, the remains of this mech and that uses this technology to create the Death Star? And that's like how Palpatine's cameo will be introduced. Because it was very, I mean, come on. They're already working on the Death Star, I think, to some degree. Because they, yes, they show the plans yeah. in Revenge of the Sith, I think. Or, at the, or right, it's at the yeah. end of... It's the Attack of the Clones. End of Attack of the Clones, right? Our master yeah. weapon, they must not get the plans. Right. So, I mean, that could be connected too, because that's from Geonosis, right? So that's a mm -hmm. weird desert planet. Whatever planet the mech was on, also desolate. I mean, maybe it was blown up and, you know, war-torn or whatever, but other mysteries there that maybe connect. You're right. Maybe, maybe it goes to Palpatine. So many mysteries. It's a web. I love it. Lots of mystical stuff. Another thing, did you notice that they just kept saying legends this episode? Uh, I noticed when she said, like, this is ancient, you know, this is uh, the legend or whatever. And then they leave the mine and they're mad that they didn't come out with the crystal and... Uh, Omega says, oh, the legends were real. Just like a nice yeah, yeah, yeah. poetry call back to Rey in The Force Awakens. The Jedi were real. Yeah. I thought that was like the, clearly the same kind of sentiment there. Yeah, legends. So are we winking at, at the audience using the term legends? I, or I'd like to think so. I'd like to think that this is like a more, we're bringing more legends up. So with that line of thinking... I, tr I looked up everything that Fee had talked about this episode. <laughs> so here's the list. She talks about, obviously, Scalinar, which is where we go to. The Octomorph, the Grand Pearl of Novak, the Belmont Diadem, and the King of Elways. From what I've researched, none of those are legends. Mm stuff. Mm. I was really hoping that they would all be like Legends Easter eggs, but they're not. Mm. So 
all that buildup of me talking for that long for nothing. <laughs> Thanks. We'll <laughs> never get that back. <laughs> <laughs> but I really wish they were Easter eggs. And I hope that this is like a wink and a nod to maybe some more like Legends stuff or more like fun mystical Star Wars coming. Yes, there, there should be legends that just exist in universe. You know, I think that right, right, is right. probably the more romantic way to look at it. And I think some fans look at the actual expanded universe legends that way as well. You know, like, and, and her character, Fee, is making up stories and changing them according to the Bad Batch. So that's the, the tall tale, you know? So I think that's, that's cool. And if we've never heard of this stuff, maybe we will along the line. So it's all good, man. Yeah. No, I want more. <laughs> do you want more? How do you want the Bad Batch to go? Do you want more of this? Now that we've had it, do you want more of this mystical stuff introduced, sprinkled throughout the show? Or do you want them to get back to their Bad Batch duties? Yeah, I think that was one of the comments we got was like, I'm not as much into the Bad Batch because there's no lightsabers and, you know, whatever, like whatever your Star Wars is. I, I like that they're doing a little bit of everything. You know, I, I guess I'm, I'm on the fence and I, you know, different answer every week I'll give. You want it serialized. <laughs> you want a classic Star Wars adventure. I just rewatched uh, A New Hope in doing some research for new song and video I'm working on. And like that original story in the adventure there is just, it is like wonderfully crafted together. It just works. And it feels like you're growing with Luke and Leia and Han. And then they blow up the Death Star. It's this perfect through line through that movie that they were able to pull together. So I love when that happens in any other Star Wars, of course. And yeah, the lighting up rocks, it's fun and it's special. And it like the mystery that's there is great versus something like an Andor when he's just trying to break out of prison and there's no force, you know, and there's no hope. And it's still a great story and it's great cinematography and acting and everything else is great. But without that sense of, you know, without the Jedi, there can be no balance in the world. Like that <laughs> X factor of the mystical part of Star Wars is part of the DNA. It doesn't always have to be there because not everyone is a Jedi or force sensitive. But when it is there, I think that's always going to work for a large set of the mm -hmm. audience. And this is the trick. You've got to strike the balance. There wasn't any of this mm -hmm. mysticism in Andor, you know, but it was a totally yeah, yeah, different right. avenue. Yeah, I, I think that's the key is, is how do you find that balance? And it seems like we're walking that line now. And Fee is mentioning the Jedi. Tech is talking about these other societies. I think they're doing a good job balancing between the two. As long as we don't get stuck in one rut or the other, it's a great catch-all, I think. So yep. keep up the good work. Once again, story <laughs> team for Bad Batch. I'm satisfied with what it is. I don't want to change what it is. Yep, yep. I agree. 100%. And speaking of tech, we got tech. We got more tech. Tech had more lines this episode again. And we, again, another theme we've been discussing is tech learning more about older cultures and older wisdom and maybe that becoming more and more important to him as things go on. And we saw that again here, which I love. I love this for tech. I can't wait to see where it goes for him. I would say that Besides Omega, I'm most interested in Tech's future based on these past couple of episodes. All right, surprise question, or has been the case this season, uh, maybe not so surprising question, Royce. <laughs> we talk about the future of the Bad Batch. We talk about Hunter being a grump and getting jealous. Do you think there was chemistry between Hunter and Fee. Ooh. Do you think that that's somewhere they would go with this? Because it was Hunter, Fee, and Omega for half the episode. That is a left, right out of left field, or I don't know, baseball. <laughs> is that a thing that we can use for this metaphor? Yeah, that's, I, I'm at a loss for words there. I wasn't picking up on it, but now that you've planted the seed, they're definitely not getting along. And, you know, Leia and Han didn't get along at the beginning. I don't think there's anything that Fee has that Hunter necessarily wants, though. I see it as more of a jealousy rather than an attraction or like a schoolyard mate that you're like, I'm going to push you in the mud, but I actually like mm. you. I'm seeing a lot of jealousy there. There's obviously a type of chemistry, but I don't think that it's a positive one. I think it's a, a nuclear one. <laughs> For some reason, I was very in tune to it this episode, and it seems like just the kind of thing Star Wars would do. 
like you said, very Han and Leia type relationship with maybe like some gender role swapping there. But I like to think as Hunter grows through what we're seeing them go through so far this season, that having this other person that Omega looks up to and that becoming what what brings him closer to Fee and like learning more about her and then like learning more about each other and stuff might be where this goes. I thought some moments between the two of them were kind of like sweet in a, in a chemistry way throughout this episode. Like I said, I think it's exactly like what Star Wars would do. There was just some fun banter. Like she says, loosen up bandana. And he says, we've almost died three times already. And I just saw that as like kind of fun banter. Uh, <laughs> as he's like, I'm mad at you for putting us in danger. But also like he does the same exact thing every other week. So uh, yeah, hmm. I, I, I would, I'm interested to see what they do with that. But I, I do think like her and Omega's closeness will bring him closer to Fee as well. We shall see. I'm going to have to rewatch because this, like I said, you're throwing me for a loop there. All right, listeners. So we want to know what you're thinking about Fee. Force sensitive, the best pirate, Hondo versus Fee. Who knows? We're going to have to do a top 10 uh, pirate roundup by the end of the season. Oh, shit. I'm here for it. Let us know if you are shipping Hunter and Fee and what their ship name would be. We've had some bad luck coming up with monikers on this episode, so I'm not even going to attempt it. <laughs> but you let us know on social media. Leave us a comment on YouTube. Tweet at us. Search Krypton to Alderaan wherever you like to social media and podcasts. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for making it to the end of the show. And tune in next week for more coverage on this season of The Bad Batch. I've been Royce. I've been some ancient alien. And we've been Krypton 2. Krypton 2.